Hi, I'm Doug Barsley. I'm the co-author with Alan Meadows of this volume, which is Burgundy Vintages, A History from 1845. And today I'm going to be talking about some of the themes of this book, some of the things that have made Burgundy what it is today, and some of the challenges that Burgundy continues to face. I'd like to thank the Wine Education Council for hosting this seminar at Spago in Beverly Hills. Our, our speaker today, Doug Barsley, is one of the more interesting people, I would say, in the, in the wine community. Thank you, John, very much. Um, and I also particularly wanted to thank the Wine Education Council, uh, both for sponsoring this seminar and, and one uh, we did up in San Francisco a couple of days ago, uh, and also for their assistance and support in the uh, long gestation period of this book, which actually uh, took uh, Alan Meadows and me uh, nearly nine years to complete. Um, it's, it's been, fortunately, uh, when I began, I had no idea it was gonna take that long. Or I, might, I might have run away, but uh, uh, it, it's, it's here now. Uh, it's the, the culmination of a, of a lifetime of drinking. Uh, and I, uh, I intend to continue on uh, doing that as, lo as long as I can. Um, <clears throat> I, I first became interested in Burgundy's uh, really in the late uh, 70s and early 80s. I uh, came to it as many people did uh, from uh, an initial uh, love of Bordeaux. Uh, other people come from uh, Napa and other Cabernets, but it's a it's, uh, not infrequent journey. Um, but uh, the real, uh, what I discovered uh, at that time is that there was very little guidance uh, about Burgundy and most of what guidance was out there was, some of it was just flat out wrong. Uh, and Burgundy vintages, for example, were usually judged by how well uh, the harvest had gone in Bordeaux, uh, and and uh, <clears throat> and the same the same critics who were making those brilliant judgments would also tell you that that Burgundy doesn't age, uh, and and for a while I believed that, and then the the 1983 vintage came on the scene, uh, and it was highly touted by the critics, a number of those same critics, though they would deny it today. Um, and uh, it, it, when it arrived, it was highly priced and it was pretty dreadful. Um, so I, I, I was kind of looking at what else was available and it turned out that there were wines from the uh, 60s and 50s and 40s, uh, older Burgundies that, that uh, were cheaper than the current releases and I thought, well, let me try some of these uh, and, and we'll see. And it, it turned out, what I learned was that uh, Burgundy does, not only does it age, but it, it acquires uh, a very different character as it does. And, and the wines, with enough time, become silky and rounded and, and they're, they, they become a whole. It's no longer simply the sum of a lot of uh, <clears throat> you know, different sensations of this fruit or, or you know, that, that mineral. Uh, element, it, it, it's uh, something that just in, engulfs all your senses and uh, there are, that, that still is true today, um, there's still wines from, from the 30s and even earlier, although uh, I have to say when I start talking about uh, 19th century wines, uh, people look at me politely but uh, um, they don't quite believe it, but uh, in fact, uh, I've tasted enough of those uh, to, to really be able to say that, you, no, there, there are going to be plenty of dead bottles, but uh, you're also going to find some that are still uh, alive and ethereal and extraordinary, and, and your odds are probably not that much worse uh, than buying a 10-year-old Maraché. Um, so, uh, given, given the problems with Premox today, uh, you know, so anyway, if, if, 
if you have that opportunity, if you can afford that opportunity, um, and, and affording any opportunity in Burgundy is, is one of the issues that we'll, we'll talk about later, I, I would strongly uh, urge you to take it. Um, much of this, although much of the book is about vintages, um, there, there also is a great deal in there about history, and it's that that I want to touch briefly on um, to begin with. Uh, Aubert de Valen has said that, that you can't understand Burgundy without understanding its history, uh, and I believe that that really is, uh, is true. Um, there, uh, we take a lot for granted today in Burgundy. This is, as John said, uh, a golden age uh, for Burgundy, but uh, it was not that way when I first started drinking these, and, and it, it, uh, it could have turned out very differently. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some of those uh, themes, but also about the challenges to Burgundy today, and, and of course along the way we're going to taste a few wines, but not quite yet. Um, so. Um, for centuries, uh, the history of Burgundy really could be defined as uh, the struggle to create great wines in a marginal climate. Uh, and for most of the time, if you, if you look back at any particular decade in, this, in the book, uh, you'll see that probably at least three vintages out of ten and sometimes more were absolute disasters uh, producing wines that are near nearly undrinkable even at the time uh, if you look at the 60s uh, uh, 63 65 68 were all dreadful into the 70s same thing um, 74 75 77 and then you get some middling vintages that are, are useful, uh, and then maybe uh, two or, if you're lucky, three great vintages that really express uh, what Burgundy is all about. Um, that has changed substantially uh, in the current era, and in that is really, I think, a, a function of climate change. Uh, what you're seeing today uh, is very different from from what the the history shows us in the uh, in the entire uh, 20th century for example there wasn't a single vintage harvest that started in August um, today in this still precocious 21st century there already have been six and I'm sure there'll be more to come um, what you're seeing additionally is that those harvests generally are taking place two to three weeks earlier than the historical norm. Um, and you know, some, in some ways this is terrific. We're seeing uh, no, there's no contemporary corollary of, of those really dreadful vintages, uh, take like a 63 or 65, uh, even the, the lesser vintages of, of recent memory like 04 have provided wines that may not be wonderful but they they have some drinkability and 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 some utility to them but so that's changed and and we're getting more vintages that are ripe uh, and not merely sugar ripeness but phenolic ripeness as well um, at the same time what you're seeing is uh, change in is a, a corollary with climate change uh, is that the, some of the weather events are getting sharper, if you will. Um, one of the things that's of current concern, even in, in, uh, as recently as a week ago, uh, was uh, frost uh, in the vineyards. And while that's certainly been, a, uh, that danger has always been a part of the history of Burgundy, uh, what's happening now is you're getting earlier bud break, and so uh, that uh, times at which uh, frost might have occurred and done very little damage now become times uh, at which that damage can be se very severe. Um, you're also seeing a change in some of the pattern of the hailstorms, which used to uh, come over the hills from, from uh, west to east, and now 
you're starting to see more of those storms that go straight up the coat. And so instead of uh, hitting one narrow area, they, they cut uh, quite a wide swath. So those are some of the, uh, the issues, but uh, I think overall, um, it's probably was best put by um, uh, Freddie Munier, who said that, that uh, for centuries, really, uh, the effort in Burgundy has been to find ways, whether it's uh, through clones or canopy management or any other thing they could think of, to get the grapes to ripen more quickly. Um, and now they're ripening probably too quickly, and they're going to really need to start rethinking uh, the entire viticulture, uh, all of their vitic well, at least a good measure of their viticultural practices. And that, that thinking has only just begun, but it's, it's something that's, that's going to characterize uh, the future of Burgundy. Um, that the other, um, another broad theme that, that's characterized that history is, is the fight against uh, pests and diseases. And, and the worst of that uh, was really the era of phylloxera, which completely changed uh, the face of Burgundy. Uh, and <clears throat> had you been in Burgundy 150 years ago, you wouldn't have seen a single straight row of vines anywhere. The, the vines were were all uh, own rooted vines. They're done over, under a system of uh, called provignage, and uh, where a cane would be tied down into the soil, and it would develop its own new roots. But as a result, um, the vines were growing everywhere, and there was no way. I mean, to to plow uh, that with a horse, let alone. I mean, this is pre mechanization, but but that whole system. Uh, really required uh, some fairly back-breaking personal labor to, to uh, tend the vineyards. Um, obviously that, that changed considerably, but, but the process of that change um, created uh, severe hardships uh, in Burgundy. What happened was that the small landowners were faced with the costs of entirely replanting their vineyards uh, in order to combat phylloxera, which was a, a gift from America. Um, they had to replant everything onto uh, American rootstocks that were resistant uh, to the phylloxera. And that whole changeover was a, an enormously expensive project. Most small landowners couldn't afford it. even. Large landowners, the Ouvrard family, one of, at, at one time one of the wealthiest in France, and it had owned Romane Conti. It owned the whole of the Clos de Bougeau, uh, and it, it had to sell that because it simply couldn't afford the replanting costs. The result of that was that power really uh, came into the hands of the negociant firms because they just bought grapes. They didn't. They didn't really have much in the way of their own holdings, and they were an intermediary, and, and uh, so they didn't have the same costs. And the problem they faced in their businesses was that they felt the need of making a consistent product. Uh, what do you do with those lousy vintages? Well, <clears throat> part of the answer to what do you do with those lousy vintages is you import some wine from a much sunnier climate, uh, and uh, you, you make up a wine that expresses uh, what, what today we would call a brand. And so uh, you know, for a long time, uh, Musigny or Chambertin wasn't simply a place. Uh, often it was just a brand. Uh, and you see, for example, uh, almost no 19th century Clos de la Roche. Uh, why is that? It all went into making up Chambertin, because Chambertin had a big name and it could be sold as such. Um, and there was a whole system called equivalence used to, to justify this, but, but it was, a, I mean, it was itself a pernicious practice, but not nearly as bad as, as bringing the wines up uh, from the Rhone or further south, even, even as far as Algeria, which was then considered part of metropolitan France. And so, okay, 
you know, why not? Um, that, that, that fight really for the soul of Burgundy uh, went on for a very long time. There were some ineffectual laws uh, in the, um, the, uh, starting in 1905, but it really wasn't until the adoption of the AOC system uh, that you began to have the legal support uh, needed to, to really enforce the, the idea that we take for granted today uh, that, that it's terroir that, that controls and that's, that's the soul of Burgundy really is, is in those individual vineyards and in those individual distinctions. Um, and even at that, I mean, those laws came into effect in the late 30s uh, and yet still uh, as late as the 1970s, um, there still were a lot of wines that, that uh, were being composed. I, somebody just served last, last night uh, up in San Francisco a bottle of 1953 uh, Bone Brisson, and I, I just put my nose in the glass and it's just like, okay, um, this is a nice Syrah. Um, <laughs> But uh, um, there's, there's a, um, a quote that, that uh, I'll read uh, from um, Russell Hone, who was a member of the, the British wine trade for a long time. Uh, and um, he, he, what he said was, uh, before 1973, most Burgundy was heavy, alcoholic, rich, and generally pretty awful. Uh, moreover, the practice of cutting had been going on for so long, the average Englishman honestly believed this is what Burgundy was supposed to taste like. Um, the irony is that when genuine Burgundy started being imported, I vividly remember the indignation of some consumers who thought what they were now buying was actually fake because it bore no resemblance to what they had been, they were used to as Burgundy. So um, you had, um, this 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 was still going on, as I say, when I when I started getting involved in Burgundy, and the average quality of Burgundy was well below uh, what it is today, uh, and and not only for that reason, uh, the other thing that had happened, uh, even as uh, you started to get uh, more domain bottling in starting in the, the 1930s and, and uh, uh, better wine, a lot of great wines were produced in, in particularly in the post-war years, uh, 45, 47, 49, for example. But after the war, um, there were a lot of uh, uh, chemicals that had been used uh, during the war that, that needed an outlet and uh, they were, uh, they seemed to be the solution to a lot of the problems that the Burgundians were faced with, that uh, um, this was a way to deal with all of those pests and diseases and to uh, uh, be able to, to grow, uh, have, have greater yields. And there also were more prolific clones uh, available at that time. And so uh, a lot of changes went on uh, during the 50s uh, that came to have really severe consequences uh, for the quality of Burgundy uh, in the 70s and, and the 80s. And it, at first, nobody really recognized it, but eventually, uh, some of the younger winemakers, people like Christophe Rumier, Dominique Lafon, who'd been raised on, on the great wines that, that their grandfathers had made uh, in those 40s vintages, uh, started to say there's something wrong here and they made they started to make the changes that needed to be made um, there was a, a an influential um, uh, geologist uh, aptly named Claude Bourguignon um, <laughs> who, who uh, famously remarked that that the soils of the Sahara had more life than the soils of Burgundy um, and so uh, you had uh, the very beginnings uh, there of, of uh, today, uh, the, the uh, emphasis on organic and, and on uh, uh, biodynamic wines. Um, but also what happened was that you had these producers making 
wines that, that really were superior uh, to uh, the wines being made by uh, the guys next door. But, and the guys next door noticed, but what they wanted to see is, okay, you know, this is costing you a lot more money. Are, are you actually gonna be able to sell your wines for more uh, than I can? Because otherwise, why am I gonna do this? Um, my, yields, my yields will be down and, and I'll end up making less money out of this deal. Um, and, and at the time, um, even into, I, I, uh, I have a, a, um, a flyer from a wine store in San Francisco from 1985 um, that shows that uh, the Bunmar, uh, the 1959, uh, for example, Bunmar from Louis Latour um, was going for more money than the Bunmar from from uh, Georges Rumier, um, and something that's that's astonishing to us today when when. Uh, that that uh, Rumier would be going for I don't know ten or twenty times at least uh, the price of the Latour wine, um, but at that time Latour was a well-known name and Rumier was not, and that until that situation finally changed, uh, it really uh, took uh, the um, a lot of the producers just didn't follow on you. You saw those changes finally taking place in the late 80s, and, but even in 1990, uh, the number of people who were producing uh, great Burgundies was, is pretty tiny compared to uh, what it was 10 years later and, and really tiny uh, compared to what it is today. So um, <clears throat> again, um, we've really reached that. Uh, this this uh, this golden era where where the the economics of Burgundy have changed uh, changed radically, um, and uh, you know together with these things uh, there were other changes going on that that uh, uh, made a huge difference. Sorting tables uh, we talk about this in the book. Uh, it was one of the biggest changes uh, that happened uh, in Burgundy and and. Uh, even even the more rudimentary ones made a huge change in the ability to eliminate uh, unripe grapes, diseased grapes, etc. Uh, today, you've got uh, for those who can afford it, uh, these extraordinarily uh, sophisticated optical sorting tables, uh, and they'll they'll take one one bad grape and just basically blow it <laughs> blow it away. Um, they're, they're extremely expensive, um, but again, that, that pursuit of the highest quality um, is being rewarded today, and um, so um, this, this has brought us uh, essentially to where we are uh, today, where again, um, the, the quality is extraordinary. Uh, that's being produced across the board and, and the producers are being rewarded. Um, you're seeing uh, proliferation not only of uh, cranes building new cellars and new houses and so on, but uh, in the driveway uh, where there used to be a little battered uh, panel truck, there's now a Bentley or a Ferrari in a lot of cases. And, and things have never been a, as good in that regard. Um, I think with that background, we should uh, segue into tasting some wines, and, and then uh, uh, after that, uh, I'll talk a little more uh, about um, why uh, prosperity and other things may, may turn out to be a uh, mixed blessing at best for Burgundy. Um, while they're uh, going to come around and, and pour, uh, if there are any questions at this point, um, Happy to take them, or we'll uh, we'll wait till you get some uh, alcohol and. Uh, <laughs> um, I think it would be um, useful to uh, talk uh, as as we're going to be talking about specific vintages, but um, as important as that is, uh, it's also in Burgundy a bit of a fool's errand. Um, the um, 
one, one of the things you find is that uh, even in the greatest vintages, um, there are still guys who, who can barely keep it together and are producing un incredibly mediocre wines that are uh, severely overpriced. And as, they, as the prices go up, uh, it becomes more and more important uh, to find uh, the best quality. But also, uh, maybe in some ways more important for, for collectors and people who buy wine, um, there are typically in Burgundy great finds available in, in even the very worst vintages. And uh, it's often worth um, seeking out the guys uh, who, who overperformed in those vintages um, because um, the uh, essentially in Burgundy, um, you get uh, a vintage gets a reputation very early on. Uh, often, as soon as it's picked uh, or in barrel thereafter, and that reputation stays uh, with the vintage uh, for better or for worse. Um, a great example uh, for me uh, because I got it wrong. Uh, was 1990, which was proclaimed at the time as, as one of the great vintages of the century. Uh, and they seemed that way uh, very early on, uh, not only in barrel, but when the wines first came in, I mean, they, they were extraordinary. Um, today we're finding out that a lot of those wines have uh, baked aromas and flavors and were not nearly as successful as they were made out to be, even though the very best of them are, uh, are all that they should be, but, but it's a small number of them. Uh, whereas at the same time, uh, the 91s, the vintage that came after, uh, even the producers didn't particularly care for it, uh, and everybody dismissed it. Um, it was completely overlooked in the market. and. And in truth, I mean, following my own notes, uh, tasting notes, it took about 10 years before the wines became uh, at all attractive. And today, uh, if you compare even the greatest wines, I mean, side by side, um, something like Rousseau Chambertin 91 and 90, or uh, DRC Richbourg, or, or uh, Romane Conti, uh, if you're that lucky. Um, you know, the, the 90, 91, as great as the, those producers' 90s can be, I mean, the 91s will generally show better. I mean, they're extraordinary wines. Uh, unfortunately, it's a very small vintage, and unfortunately, uh, uh, now uh, there are a bunch of people who figured it out. But <laughs> um, for those who, those who figured it out early on uh, uh, and took a chance uh, were, Highly rewarded, and um, and and it's always worth um, trying to trying to figure those.